what I'm doing is a rotating two week schedule um, <clears throat> for two separate weeks. I do a theme. So uh, because I do two time zones. So this is the uh, Europe, Arab world, America morning. And we're going to do blooming espresso. And if some of you were on last week's it's me blooming espresso again. That was America, Asia. I do have a question from Barney who asked that there's a bunch of discussion about blooming and what's the current state of the art, what are various people's opinions. I did not get into that last week. So if you want to get into that, uh, in other words, what's the theory behind blooming? Why is it the way it is? And if you take other approaches with blooming, what's the effect? That's an interesting conversation to have. I'm going to dim this guy, see that he's too bright for the screen. That's better. Uh, before I start, though, are there any questions anyone wants to take the conversation? Because blooming is basically the topic today once we've taken care of what other questions people have. Uh, one thing I do want to do is those of you who are customers, if you've got an espresso machine nearby, um, please go ahead and make a blooming with me when we get to that point. Um, if you've got the display stand, you know, you can just take the tablet and bring it and, uh, and do that. And we really can see it. So once you do your blooming espresso, taste it and show us these charts, this chart here, and we'll be able to give you advice if you didn't do it perfectly. Um, one thing I do recommend right now is everybody go to settings, presets, and choose Blooming Espresso and hit OK. And that will preheat your machine to 97.5 Celsius, which is the start of the Blooming Espresso. It's one of the hottest, I think it is the hottest start of any profile on the D1. And <clears throat> giving it a good two minutes to heat the group head to that temperature will help the start be that. Uh, so I'm gonna have a sip of tea. And anyone have any questions, experience with your D1? Um, actually, let me turn chat on. Hey, John. Yeah. I have a question about um, maybe further down the road, but it's a burning question for me. I've been doing blooming for the last, I don't know, six months, a year, almost exclusively. And um, what I've been finding is that even as I've tried to regularize every step of the way, I find that when there's a long pause, like overnight, uh, maybe between the morning and the afternoon, that I can get radical changes in the ramp bar uh, pressure even though I'm doing everything identically. I even got to the point of starting to freeze beans, thinking maybe if I put the bean in at the same temperature every time, it would be the same. And sometimes I'll pull it at one grind setting, it'll go to 11 and a half. I'll pull it again and it'll be at three. And I can't for the life of me figure this out. Okay, um, let's definitely hit that topic. The, the first thing to note is there are empty air tubes between, well, air, air there are water tubes between the water heater and the group. Your first shot of the day, if you're trying to get everything perfect, I would recommend that you flush. Uh, yeah, I've done that. I, I tried that for a while. That kind of helped, but it didn't eliminate the- uh, Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that's the source. I just mentioned that. Um, okay. Uh, that the first shot of the day, not a bad, a bad idea. I mean, it depends on the, the, the profile. Uh, <clears throat> any pro, I'm not sure it's really gonna matter. Uh, if the tubes are really empty from overnight, the pre-infusion's at four mils per second, it's going to take two, three seconds maybe to fill all the tubes and the water's gonna come out. And since the pressure is the exit condition for pre-infusion, I don't know that it would have any effect. Um, it's just that you might see 14 seconds for pre-infusion versus 11, but three of those seconds were no water coming out. So your chart looks a little bit different, but the coffee should be treated the same way. So I don't think that that's the case. Um, my, um, I, well, actually, first question, are those um, light, ultralight, medium, what kind of beans are you using? 
I'm a little confused to what to call what what now. Uh, let's call them what Tim Wendelbow would be a, a light, I would assume. If not even ultralight, yeah. Um, yeah, but these are, these are his espresso, not his filter blends, uh, roasts. Oh, these are espresso. That's true with coffee, that's true with passenger, but I assume those are all on the light side of the spectrum. Yeah, um, I just want to make sure. Are you guys seeing the person speaking? When, the, when, when Roger, you're speaking, you guys seeing him? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Because I, I clicked on myself. I can see myself, but I want to make sure. Um, I don't we unpin video. There we go. Great. Um, so just the way people talk about light, ultra light, and medium is in terms of crack. Um, and you got your first crack and your second crack. But since you weren't there to witness the, the, the roasting, I don't really think that that's that helpful. They also talk about it in terms of roast color uh, and development. That's um, hard as well. Um, I prefer to think about to um, think about them in terms of what it tastes like. So a medium is going to give you chocolate with uh, maybe some other things. Medium dark is just going to be chocolate with some burn. As you go to medium light, you'll get to chocolate plus some other flavors. If it's a natural, maybe a strawberry, um, maybe some red wine, maybe some tropical fruits. As you move from medium light to light, the chocolate notes will go away. They'll get replaced by lighter caramelization flavors. Um, toffee is a really common one. Um, and, and then as you move to even lighter, you move into sort of tea land where you just have something incredibly fragrant that most people wouldn't even recognize as coffee. Um, and then the world is your oyster in terms of flavors. It's, but nothing in that flavor profile on ultralight would be anything like a Nescafe. It's just, it's, they're just totally different products. Um, the other thing I'd say is the ultralights will have tendency to be ultra acidic. And so if your beans are really hard to extract, they might be very light. Um, they might be underdeveloped, which is to say they could have been roasted more. That's what people mean when they say underdeveloped. Um, fully developed means it tastes great. It was roasted enough, <laughs> but those are really subjective. They don't really mean anything. Um, but an underdeveloped bean sounds like a defect, but it really isn't. It just means that was a very lightly roasted bean. And it means that by underdeveloped, it means you'll have to work a little bit with your recipe to get the flavors that you want and to hide the flavors that you don't want. Okay. So it might be that your very lightly roasted bean has a tendency to give a lot of acidity um, and, and that you have to figure out a way to prevent that and let the other things come out. Okay. And that, that's really common with coffee that um, virtually all roasted beans, maybe only 20% of them don't have defects. The vast majority of roasted beans, there's a roast defect. Now, maybe we'll get to the happy, happy land where Scott Rayo has trained every roaster on the planet, and that isn't the case. Um, and he revisits them every two months. But uh, until that happens, um, roast defects are just uh, part of your coffee bean. And so the most common roast de defect you're going to see <clears throat> on a light roast, uh, at least my experience, is cardboard baked flavors. Those are really common. Um, and uh, generally, at least for me, the way I avoid those <laughs> is by pulling the shop a little bit short. And if you have, re if you have uh, flavors that are unpleasant in your bean, blooming is going to tend to bring them out. Okay, so blooming is a full saturation, full extraction approach, and defects are going to be noticed. So I, I just want to point that out. Um, so blooming is really best for coffees where kind of the only defect you have is high acidity. And that, that's the only thing, that's not really a defect, that's just how it extracts. Um, if there are bad flavors in there, it's gonna be hard to hide them. Um, and okay, John, so that thing again. Go ahead. Not bad, just wanna make sure we don't lose the, uh, the, the question about first shot of the day getting a little strange. Oh, and then after that. After. Yeah. Um, so coming back to first shot of the day and why it's varying. So um, the lighter the roast, the more likely it is to um, have the puck fall apart. Okay, so if you're using Tim Wendell bows, you're probably on the light, ultra light. Um, it also depends on the kind of bean. Um, 
So Ethiopians easier to pull than say a Kenyan, um, which will have a tendency to fall apart. Um, also, uh, like a Kenyan, wing needs to be ground really fine. Um, and so that's harder on the grinder and also more likely to fall apart. Things that don't need to be no ground as fine are more likely uh, to be more tolerant. Um, but it's just the way of the world, right? The most expensive bean requires the hardest technique and the absolute best grind. <sighs> it's just how it is. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so uh, my guess is um, what you have is puck variation is, is what you've got. Um, and we can, let's, there's another question that popped up, which was about uh, variation and dosing of a dosing cup versus dosing directly into the porta filter. Um, so <clears throat> that applies here. I don't know, Roger, how are you uh, dosing from your grinder into your porta filter? Well, I've been flipping, flip flopping back and forth recently. One, my normal strategy has been to dose into a cup, swirl, but not toss, um, uh, measure to a hunt, uh, uh, what, a uh, 15.00. <laughs> I mean, precise, um, deep, mostly deep WDT with a very fine attention to the end, um, a number of very light caps just until I see the, the puck settle, and then force tamper uh, with the uh, conical, conical the, uh, the, the one that goes down, the European ripple um, uh, convex. <laughs> what I'd like to do with you is try and remove most of those steps. And the reason is there's a number of those steps um, are interesting variability, uh, are interesting variability. And so we don't know, like the WDT, the dosing, those two are gonna be quite variable. The force tamper is gonna be absolutely regular every time. So definitely stick with the force tamper. Um, the known coffee dose is good, but I would try and remove steps because otherwise- so I, I've actually done that. I've actually removed steps as well so that there's no, no tabbing, there's no WDT, and I still find that variability happening regardless. And that's why I went to the freezing beans, because that's that one. Maybe if I get them all the same temperature from one time of the day to the next, that'll happen, but then that didn't seem to matter either. So, so I don't know. Okay, I get it. just keep re reducing things, but uh, is there anything in the machine other than the air in the tubes that would ever account for any of this? Roger, are you still using your spacer? I took that out about three months ago, Sheldon. Okay, then that wouldn't be a factor. Um, so the main thing I would say is you need to learn to study the bottom of your bottomless for a filter. Um, so the first thing I would look for is when pre-infusion ends, <clears throat> did it wet really evenly? If it didn't, immediately you know that's your problem. Well, I'm using a paper filter that changes that as well, because the paper filter seems to do a slightly different dance around the bottom of the porta filter than it does without. I don't use the and paper it doesn't filter. Come in a, yeah. Doesn't come in a donut. Um, I can't. You don't need to spend it. I'm just trying to find some some mm -hmm. answer. I, I guess let's try and simplify. So let's take the paper filter out, top and bottom, okay. because the paper filter would be probably hiding any dosing irregularities. And they might still okay. be there, but they're harder to see because the bottom comes out wet. So the first thing I would do is get rid of that paper. Um, <clears throat> we'll get back to your technique in a second. But before that, let's just try and identify and say, oh, there's the problem. Rather than just shot in the dark, changing different things, let's see if we can actually say there's a problem. So the first thing I would do is when pre-infusion ends, but actually just as the pre-infusion is about to end, you should see whoop, water appear everywhere, right? And if it appears to one side or another, you know that that's your problem. So let's get rid of paper uh, and let's study that, okay? Um, and I've seen them sweep. That's a really common thing. And especially my hunch, and it's only maybe 30% likely to be the case, is that if you're dosing with a cup, you're probably gonna see a sweep of some sort because cups tend to produce a side, dosing with a cup tends to produce a side uh, density. But the place where most um, blooming's fall apart is in the last stage when you have the pressure rise after everything. And that's where you really want to watch the bottom of your basket and, and see wh what side it's coming out of, how even it is. Um, 
if it's just falling apart and in what way. So that would be my recommendation is um, do that and we can do that on this call. We're gonna be here for a bit. So if you wanna at some point duck out um, and maybe take some photos, I, I, don't, I don't know how easy, I guess you, what you could do is take some photos and then show them in Zoom and we can look at that uh, or a video, I don't know. Um, real time on Zoom, we're not gonna have enough resolution to tell you much. Um, but those are the two things I would, I would look at. But most likely the issue you're looking at is variation in puck preparation. Um, when, if you are using a cup and there's nothing wrong with dosing into a cup. Um, well, here, here's, the, here's the thing that's interesting, John, is that after the first shot, my next four or five shots are within, you know, a, a half a bar of each other. Okay, what's your grinder? So that's why the technique sounds a little suspicious is the issue. Otherwise, those would be more variable. It's only the first shot of the day or if I'm really off the wall. Can you, so, can you just grind 10 grams through your coffee grinder and throw them out? And that would accomplish what? Well, that's if the grinder, if the first grind of the day is the variability, then that I would see. get rid of that. I, I see. Good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, what I'm thinking. I always, I always put in three grams and burn them anyway, regardless. Um, what I'm thinking is possible is that, uh, tell me your grinder again. It's, it's monolith conical, MC3. Okay. Um, I mean, even the niche has, I think about two grams of retention, but with the sure. niche. But I burn, I burn beans before I, before I pull beans uh, on every, every shot. Okay, so your first shot of the day, you've already ground and thrown some stuff out? No, I throw, I throw out about half a gram before every shot, just if I ever change the setting, for example. Right. So if I'm, that's what I'm saying, is, is just like throw half a portafilter's worth or half a dose worth into your grinder, grind it, and to have it come out. Because what the niche does is each grind gets two grams from the previous one. Sure, sure, uh, sure. And I'm wondering if that's what's going on is you've got a small amount of stale beans in the mix of your first shot. Okay, I'll try that. I'll, I'll try to burn a little bit more because maybe I'm not burning enough. All right, I'll let someone else ask a question because you don't well, need to- another question, which is, um, but it's, you, you also brought it up, which is if you dose into, let's just say a cup or you know, a grinder, uh, a, a milk jug. So there's, there's two ways to dose. Um, and there's a video out there from, uh, Espresso Forge from Andre of his technique. Now, he actually does is he takes the basket out because you don't have a porta filter on, on his machine, and and he uh, rotates the porta filter basket in order to put in the edges. Now Bugs, um, who's making some tea next to me, she uses a technique similar on the niche, but what she does, I don't know if you all will see this, but so instead of mounting here and making a mount. What she does is this, is rotate like that. So she tries to have the grind automatically go into the uh, right angle edge of the basket and to go evenly. And then at the end, she fills in the center. If there's any needed, often there isn't. Uh, those shots turn out better than me dosing directly. Um, and that's what she was doing in LA. Uh, I'm gonna just tell this story slightly. Uh, which is in the last trade show we went to was in LA and it was with Rayo um, who was there and we came with niches and Bugs was supposed to be the prep assistant and she hadn't ever done any blooming shots or actually barely any prep and Scott was pissed off. <laughs> it was like great, unseasoned grinder, newbie assistant, that's just great. Um, and um, so you say, okay, fine, let me show you how I, how I do it. And then I think shot number three was as good as Rayo's. And then from there on out, they were all better than his. Um, so having somebody who doesn't know anything and just showing them, just do this technique and do it over and over again consistently, um, often trumps experience because you have all these ideas of what you should do. And the only thing she was doing was grinding and rotating like this so that it went into the basket, right? Were you, um, yeah, you did a little bit of top grooming, just a little bit of leveling on the top, uh, not, not deep. 
and, and then a tamp. Uh, and all we were doing was Kenyan, no, and Ethiopian uh, bloomings there. And they were just bang on consistent. Um, John, there, <clears throat> this is Peter. There's another easy way to do that, I think, that doesn't involve this whole mutation. Thing. It's what I do every shot when I'm not being lazy. And it really helps with consistency. I never get consistency problems since I've started this. That is just get a flat bed into the portafilter. Am I coming through? Yeah. Just get a flat bed into the portafilter, however you like. I happen to dose from a cup into it, through a funnel into the portafilter, mm -hmm. tap once, and then make a donut. Mm. A donut is take the back end of a thin brush, like, you know, the type of brush they give for sweeping out inside the, but just, it needs to be like the, a pencil type of thing or a chopstick or anything. And don't disturb the grounds. Don't compress the grounds. Do minimal to the grounds. But take the back end of it and just make a depression in the middle. Shove the grounds away from the middle in a circular motion. Then tamp. Since I've been doing that for the past year, um, I have no consistency problems. So I'm not saying it'll fix what you're doing. But what you're doing is clearly not something to do with whether you dance six times around the church. What it is, is it's something major. There's something major happening. All these little minor things aren't doing it. This is just my opinion. All these little minor things aren't doing it. So do something major. And making a donut is something major. The only downside is it takes a bit of skill. You'll develop that after six times. And if you're really lazy and uncaffeinated, it's dangerous. Other than that, it works. Does anyone on this call have the Lynn Weber dosing tool? The thing where it doses in, you shake it and pull. Yeah, that's what I'm using. Um, that thing makes it. Uh, that that is what I'm using for this this prep. Okay. Uh, maybe about. just because when when you put the grinds in there and you lift, it actually creates uh, yeah. an inverse donut, right? There's a, a crater in the center. Well, that's what he was just suggesting, right? Yeah. So maybe we can do it just... that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it ends up with a hump in the middle eventually. Oh, does it? Because okay. when I've, I've, I've watched the video, and I have one of those as well, and when I used them, I didn't like it because I got an inverse volcano. I got a, you know, a crater in the center. No, um, I've got a volcano. I end up with a volcano, but I've never tried to take, pull the thing up and look and see what the first, you know, quarter dose is when you use that tool, see if it's actually making the donut like Peter was just suggesting. Okay. Um, how if I said huh? What's your dose size for this blooming? F fifteen grams uh, in a uh, uh, yeah, fifteen grams. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I so right. you, got, you got two ideas. I, uh, I got a lot to work. With. Thank you. <laughs> um. <clears throat> so, uh, but I'll go back to Mirko's first question, which is dosing. Uh, this is a cup. But if you use, for example, the niche cup, which is roughly the shape of this thing, um, to dose into, it's the same size as this. And what people do is they you know, do that, and then they do that. Okay. At that point, you have a big problem. Um, it was all very convenient, but your mound is doing this inside here. And you can use a tool to move everything back this way, but it doesn't matter. You've got a, comp a compression wave because everything went boom. So even if visually the top level, you've got a compression wave and you're always going to have a faster extraction on this side. So anytime you use a cup to do that, you're sunk. Um, and I'm, I'm lobbying Martin at Niche to um, solve that problem um, one way or another because um, that's, I think, the biggest consistency problem people have when they use um, the niche or an EK. EK is the same problem. Um, instead, like that. OK. Um, anyone else? No? Hey John, I'm Yes, one. John. This is David. I um, posted um, a blooming about an hour ago, just on diaspora, just in this thread. So I'm kind of curious, but this was 
a um, medium to light roast that I was trying to run like a medium and could, it just yeah. tasted awful. And I ended up, the only thing that made it taste good was the blooming. But to me, it's almost too dark a roast really to, to run like a blooming. So it'd be kind of interesting um, because I posted the video on the picture. It'd be interesting what the comments are later um, of what your thought is. Because I still don't get a total even um, as it comes out the portafilter at the beginning. It's, it's not donut, but it's not as even as some of the stuff I've seen um, other people do. You could. Well, a couple things. One is uh, blooming works with any bean, medium to light. Medium dark, it just makes all the burn flavors come out. It's not great. But if you have a nicely roasted medium bean that is just tasting like chocolate, you might do blooming and find it now has chocolate and red wine. So um, I really like blooming and I'm more of a medium to medium light guy. I find it very useful. So it is absolutely not a technique just for light. It just gets all the flavors out. Just you have to, blooming is when you're sure your bean tastes good. Um, but in terms of the start, again, so a couple of things. One is um, the water absorbency characteristics of beans does vary a bit, not hugely, but you could try speeding or slowing down your pre infusion a little bit. So blooming is at four mils per second when it starts. You could try just a little bit slower, three and a half mils per second, and see if that affects your bottom at all. Okay? Or the opposite, go to four and a half. And just see if that changes the, the trend. I wouldn't do a big leap. I wouldn't go, if you go to two mils per second, you're, you're doing something completely different. I mean, that, you're not gonna get pressure. Uh, you could go to six mils per second, and there are some people who have modified blooming that way, and I think that that probably works. I don't see a theoretical problem with faster, but I wouldn't go under three mils per second just because at that rate, you're putting water in at the same rate that the beans are likely absorbing it. And so you're not going to rise in pressure. You're not going to exit pre-infusion. You're just going to get dripping. Um, so three and a half to six. Um, I'd like to ask David a question about that poll. Go ahead. David, if you can hear me, uh, I read your post and I see you've used a brew ratio of three to one. You're putting out 56 grams from 18 grams of coffee. Just curious whether you work through that uh, range of brew ratios to uh, settle on that value and uh, maybe give some insight into what that did for you and how you figured out the, the optimal. I, so basically I've, I got these new beans uh, beginning of the week and I've been trying everything to get them to taste good. And so um, I just uh, yesterday said, screw it, I'm going to do blooming because <laughs> they weren't tasting good. I was trying to pull it just a two to one like I would for a regular medium roast. And for some reason, um, th like right at the bottom end of medium, actually they taste better. Um, so I just went for the the total the 60 grams on the blooming that it was the the preset and it stopped at 55 so nothing magic there sorry that's probably just the answer you want but um it just it, it hit some type of pressure limit or something and just stopped stopped the pool but it actually yeah. tasted really good so i've wondered um, whether me. i've wondered whether uh trying to break the uh, pour into a separate cups can help, but I haven't had a lot of success in, in really assessing yeah. the stopping point. Yeah, and I, I actually thought about doing that and then um, ran out of time. But no, that, that's a good point. Thanks. Hey John, I got a general question. Um, on temperature, if you're staying in like a one to three mil range, what should you expect uh, in terms of like the temperature puck to stay when, uh, like in degrees Fahrenheit, a couple degrees, one degree, what's the, what would be normal there? Um, sorry, I was grinding and I had the mute on, but no, I, think the, I think the question, sorry, I mute on myself and the grinder running. 
Uh, but I think the question was how much temperature stability you you expect inside blooming. Can you just come back? Well, yeah, I, it was more of a general question. If you're running in in the one to three mil range, so that's kind of like the flow going through. What would be the temperature stability? Um, so the issue is the slower you go, the more the temperature is going to be hard to maintain. And the reason is that uh, the only means we have of heating the puck is to add water. And if the flow rate's slow, then we can't inject much hot water to quickly change the speed of the puck. Um, so <clears throat> that's your first one. Are you talking about blooming or just in general, by the way? Just, yeah, just in general, just okay. in general. Um, so blooming is giving you a false reading during the pause because the temperature sensor is above the puck. And when you stop the water, then the only thing that's happening at that point, we can't actually affect the temperature, right? The water's just been added. The puck and the hot water are mixing and the temperature's gonna start to decline. It's going to ho hopefully not decline precipitously because the group head has been heated quite hot. And generally that's what happens. And the blooming is set to have a declining temperature profile. The reason that that's the case is because the puck is at about 20 Celsius, hot water is at 97. When you mix the two inside a bunch of hot brass, we end up somewhere around probably 90 is realistically what's happening. So that temperature probe is, is lying a bit because when you have the puck and you put a whole bunch of hot water on it, the puck, the, the temperature is right here. There isn't movement going on. The water, the water is just pushing in like this. So it's giving you a temperature reading, which is higher than likely reality, right? Whenever you measure anything, what you're doing is you're measuring that. You're not necessarily measuring reality. Um, but temperature stability from two to three mils per second should be quite good, right? Uh, so you should expect that within 10 seconds, you're within a centigrade. Um, a lot of the times within five seconds, you're within two centigrade. That's sort of typical. Okay, thanks. I'm going to pull a blooming. Uh, I have not dialed this in. I just, I've been making default shots. This is a medium light bean. It's a Oaxacan that should taste like orange, caramel, and chocolate. Um, and I can tell you, I don't get under default profile orange. All right. So caramel is just another roasting characteristic, another caramelization. So sure, it's in there. But orange mm, and just a, a slight thing coming from the wine world. I wish the coffee people would differentiate citrus flavors between the juice, the pith, and the zest. Because orange could be orange juice, clarified orange juice, orange pith, orange zest. And all those flavors absolutely exist in coffee. But they, we should use that word. Um, same thing for lemon, same thing for grapefruit, right? Grapefruit zest is incredibly common in light roast coffee as a flavor, but not, if you have grapefruit juice, especially clarified grapefruit juice flavor, you're probably just extracting it badly. It's, a, it's, an, it's an unpleasant flavor. Um, okay, so on my niche, I've gone two notches finer, which is roughly what I need. I just let it spin. As I'm expecting this not to be perfect, I did not dump some coffee through it first to clean the burrs. If I knew the exact grind, and it really was two, two and a half, then Sure, I could change it, put some in, and do it. Um, really the best bet though, when I'm uh, doing two kinds of beans is to have two niches here, one dial into each one. Um, I don't expect any grinder to lurch between big grind settings within one shot accurately. Okay, so, um, oh, and if, you're, if you don't own a DU1, can you just say so on the chat? Because right now we're super focused in this call on people who own it which I'm totally fine with. You guys can observe what it's like to own this machine, but I also want to answer any questions you have. So that's why I'm also doing some basics about uh, the blooming espresso. Uh, so this is the model 1.3. So I just touch there and it starts. Let's get a clear glass. Um, I do recommend if you're doing blooming uh, and you're drinking it straight to use uh, some sort of glass that's cool because blooming comes out with a lot of water very hot and it's hard to drink so you want to cool it down if you're drinking it neat okay. i'm not going to mess with this as it runs but there's pressure rising as pre-infusion ends 
Um, and I can tell you this, uh, we're gonna look at the chart in a second, but it's not great. Where our pressure bump exited at four bar. Uh, on the other hand, I'm getting very little dripping. Um, if you have a scale on there, if you have the Bluetooth scale, then you'll see the current shot weight going up. And it seems that dripping between three and seven grams before the pressure rise gives us the ideal flavor. Now this comes out of nowhere other than experience. There's no fear or anything. But if you have no dripping during that pausing stage, okay, this might actually be okay. Uh, one thing that's nice for people who don't own the D1 is this is a really fancy shot and yet it is just on autopilot. Ah, this is not normal blooming. That's fine. This is blooming with a pressure end instead of a flow end because I was experimenting, which is fine. Um, what was I saying? Da, da, da. Oh yeah, blooming, all these shots are interesting because they're, they're fancy shots, um, yet they just run on their own. So I'm gonna take apart, for everyone who owns D1, you already know this, maybe you'll learn something, maybe not. Uh, just to go on temperature stability, um, you can see the shot did the temperature we wanted. So um, we aim for 97 and we wanted a temperature decrease and we have a nice linear decrease in temperature across the shot and the shot ended where we wanted it, which was 91. Okay, so um, now this is the one, this is uh, yesterday's firmware. So um, you'll also see, I think you might be able to see here, you can see a thin line, which is the temperature being injected. And we are injecting much hotter water there. And then as we hit the temperature and the, and the goal changes, we put slightly cooler water in, and then the natural cooling um, uh, of the puck just automatically brought us down. But that, this is really what we're aiming for. When we made this espresso machine, everyone was talking about temperature stability. No one had temperature profiling. So that was our goal back then. And it's taken a lot of work um, to be able to change the temperature quickly, because that's usually not what you want, right? You want the same temperature. Um, and I'm, I'm that's, that's, I'm pretty happy with that. It's just nice linear decrease ending at the goal. Um, all right, and then I tap here. So what I'm doing here for people who don't own a D1 is I'm tapping on the temperature line. Uh, it's still too bright. That's better. Okay, what I'm doing is tap, tapping on the temperature line. Oh, shoot. If you go to settings, okay, you wipe the existing shot out because you're gonna make another shot. <sighs> Shoot, okay. Um, <clears throat> everybody remember what the shot did? So uh, what I did on this blooming, and I'd forgotten that I programmed it that way, is blooming usually ends with constant flow. And the reason Rayo did it with constant flow is because constant flow uh, automatically fixes channeling. Okay. Let me unpack that for a second. If you say you wanna get a constant flow of two mils per second, and uh, your coffee puck gives up the ghost temporarily and doesn't resist water, the flow rate, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the, um, the back pressure suddenly goes down, but the flow rate stays constant, okay? And actually, <clears throat> if you use pressure at the end, the opposite happens, which is if your puck suddenly opens up, then it has no pressure, then the machine is going to increase the flow rate to bring the pressure back to where it was. So flow profiling naturally heals channels, pressure profiling naturally aggravates channels. So this is one of the reasons our coffee tastes better with flow profiling steps if we're having channeling. Um, so that's the reason he did that. Now, I do wanna just point out, uh, you can, I think all of you can see that. Um, I got a lot of crema, right? And that, that's just a traditional looking espresso, even though it was blooming. And I think I was nine bar at the end. So what I did, is I just modified blooming to have nine bars. So really all this shot was is um, the E61 profile with pre-infusion. So it's to say a nine bar shot, except with a 30 second pause. So that, that's what I just did. And uh, there is a lot of water there. I probably ran it too long because I forgot I did that, but I'm gonna taste it. 
Um, and I'm using a lot of glass in order to cool it off. Right? You, can, you might be able to see there's steam coming off of it still. It's super pleasant and I get orange peel. So that's the orange flavor that I'm looking for. A little bit of orange pit too, but no juice. Um, so, and more types of caramelization. And I don't have any burnt, I don't have any burnt flavors. So for me, I'm really happy with that. And we can talk about how I changed the blooming to do that uh, on, on this machine <clears throat> from the default. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm demoing while discovering on my own. But I'm gonna go to settings here and then advanced. And here are the blooming, ah, okay. So what I did with this, if you can see, is I've got, at the end of blooming, I've got a ramp up, and then I hold at three and a half mils per second, right, which is a fast flow rate. But if the pressure goes over nine bar, which is what I have there, okay, I don't, I, I find that blooming over 10 bar tastes terrible, muted. So I added this little step here, which is a 9.5 bar alternative. So what happens is if I do a fast flow rate, which would be good for a light roast, and I don't go over nine bar, that's how blooming ends, no problem. But if I go, if, if I go over nine bar at the end, then I'm automatically switching to a 9.5 bar alternative, which is then just continuing and finishes. And then I have a limit, which is 180 mils of, of water. So that, that limit on water needs to get adjusted to, to what uh, is reality on this. And uh, probably this limit is the reason the shot didn't stop right, because this is newer firmware, which is more accurate. And uh, before we were misestimating the, the water limit. So if I pull this again, I'll do it with a scale so I can see where I stop it, how much water was consumed, and I set the limit there so it auto stops. Uh, but to go back to this, um, what I was arguing to Rayo is that the flow rate at the end of blooming is not as important as we thought. That blooming, uh, blooming's where the pressure is under four bar at the end taste terrible. We don't get any crema, they just, they're just awful. And I don't mind having a higher flow rate at the end because I've had, unlike a traditional espresso where everything happens in 28 seconds, uh, and the flow rate's super important because your coffee is being extracted right then. By the time the blooming is at the end and pushing the water out, you've had 55 seconds of water contact time with your beans. So the coffee is largely extracted into the water that's already there. So all you need to do now is push that stuff out and hopefully under pressure so you get some emulsification and some oil. And I think what's happening is that if we just push the espresso out at the end, at like three bar, we're just essentially doing a one minute pour over. And we don't have the oils and the emulsification coming out and whatever compounds also come out under pressure. Because some coffee compounds only come out of pressure. So I feel like blooming in order for it to taste balanced with a medium to medium light bean needs to be over six bar. So, um, I don't mind fast flow rates at the end, but I do mind not enough pressure. So I put that alternative in on, on this uh, to test that and it, and it tastes good. Okay. And if I hadn't uh, done that, what would have happened in this case is it would have gone to 12 bar and it would have probably choked and been really slow, taking 80 seconds to come out because uh, the higher the pressure <clears throat> at a certain point, you actually just choke the, Increasing pressure does not increase flow beyond about 10, 10 and a half bar. It has the opposite effect. You ultra compact the puck and no water comes out. So um, I remember on my first Nespresso machine, it had 19 bar on the Nespresso and not knowing anything, I thought that was a good thing. But if you tried to make an, es an espresso at 19 bar, nothing would come out. You'd have an ultra compacted puck. So the sweet spot for medium to medium light is um, six to nine and a half bar, 10 is, is then you start to see a, a swift decrease. 
one thing I always want to say with all these things is enough videos do not talk about medium versus light beans. Um, the extraction approaches are really different. And with light roast, you generally do not want or get crema. You don't necessarily want a lot of emulsion. You're on a filter roast. And um, on light beans, uh, doing a nine bar extraction at the end often will not taste good on the blooming. That instead, something in the three to five bar range at the end of blooming seems to taste the best. Okay? The other thing is, is that um, at the end of blooming, the puck may fall apart. Uh, we can go back to that chart again, we'll pull another shot, but I, my memory was that the flow rate was very constant, even though it was a nine bar. Um, so my puck was not falling apart, which is great. And that's partially because it's a nine, uh, a medium roast. Light roasted beans at blooming tend to have a pressure spike and then fall apart. And the higher the pressure at the end, the more likely your puck is to fall apart. So less pressure for light beans gets us a flavor more typical of filters. And it also um, is gentler on the puck, less likely to fall apart in channel. Uh, by the way, that was an 18 gram dose that I, I did on that. And uh, I don't know, uh, that looks like maybe 80 mils of water. I pulled it really long. Can I ask you again about that temperature, John? Yes. Yeah, so you showed us a temperature profile, what happened, uh, a long, slow, linear decrease from the initial 97.5 down to 92, I think is the ending uh, condition. And I get the same thing, but you said it as if that was a design feature, but really the way that the profile is, is uh, constructed, it calls for an immediate drop uh, right after the initial fill down to 90 and then to 92. So what we're really asking for is a step change if we could get it. Just curious what we can get, because it didn't happen there, but also uh, what was, is intended, what's the best thing you'd, you'd like to get there? A ramp is totally different than, than steps that we put into the profile. So I'm just curious about what the... Um, so mean. the reason it's a ramp um, is because we stop the water. So we do pre-infusion at 97.5, and then we change the goal immediately to, I think, 91. But then we stop the water. So while we might tell the machine that we would like to go, to go immediately 90 to 91, uh, the reality of physics is if you also don't let the machine put water in, then there's no way for the temperature to rapidly change on the puck. Sure, I see that, that makes sense. Uh, and I do get that, but mine continues on linear all the way to the end of the pole. So mm -hmm. all the way to the end of say 60, 70 seconds and uh, mm -hmm. continues linear on. I don't see a step at the end of the uh, bloom as well. Yeah, yeah. so, so um, <clears throat> there's not, the, the only way to do a, a radical, well, a couple of things. One is instead of looking at the temperature of the puck, which is the thick red line, if you look at the, water injection temperature, the thin line, that will react to the step. So if you say you go on to go from 98 to 90, you will see the water we put in drop precipitously. Um, however, the, the D1 is designed for stable temperature because that's what everyone wanted and mostly still wants. And that's why we've got a big hunk of brass that is heated to the starting temperature, okay? So if we put water in at 90, but it goes into a group head that is entirely preheated to 98, um, it doesn't, it's not gonna drop quickly, right? We could put 80 centigrade water in there and, and then let the brass heat it up again. Uh, that would be a much more complicated physics model for us to do and might give you water that has actually varied temperature, right? Some hot, some cold parts. If you wanted to do that, what I would probably say is set your goal temperature to 98 and then 80 for five seconds and then back to 90, right? So you, you could tell it, do this radical change. Um, in version 1.5, so coming in next year, there's three parts in the, in the group head that are made of brass. There's the top, there's an initial wire dispersion, and then there's another wire dispersion and there's a shower screen. The two wire dispersion parts are being converted into a resin called Ultum. And so those will not hold heat. Uh, that will um, allow us to change the temperature that arrives at the puck faster. Because right now, if we have all those brass parts at 98 and we put nine degree water, the brass parts just heat it back up again. Um, those 
pieces will be compatible with all the previous espresso machines. So if you are interested in temperature profiling and you want uh, faster temperature changes, then those would be worth doing. Um, they also don't tarnish, which is cool. All right, makes sense, thanks. Um, but uh, I was gonna say, if you have a fast flowing espresso, like let's say an Allonger, which is what we're gonna talk about next week, then um, a fast temperature change should be possible, right? So you should be able to go from 98 to 90, um, I don't know, 10 seconds, if you're doing four mils per second and the water's flowing through. Uh, all right, someone, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, I wonder if someone's put a post, someone's posted a graphic. You guys should all be able to actually look at the graphic in the chat. Um, if that works, then yeah, cool. Um, yes, I would say, um, so you've got two options on, on your espresso. The, the question is, should he go coarser? So um, that flavor on that espresso is probably a bit muted because you went over pressure. So you've got, but you're not, you're not terribly over, over. And you can tell that you were too fine because at right at 50 seconds, see the flow dip? That's because we asked for 2.2 mils per second and we hit the pressure max of the machine. So even though you wanted to go 2.2 mils per second, the machine couldn't, it in fact couldn't go more than one until the pucker eroded some, um, about five, six seconds later, and then we were able to go at the desired flow rate, uh, but that kept the pressure really high. Um, I would experiment with editing your advanced profile and changing the flow rate at the end from two to, you, I would try like one eight or one nine. And the reason I'm coming up with that number is right at the end, right at that, that last vertical bar, you have this pressure rise, and I'm looking at the flow rate when you're at about nine bar, and it looks like it's around one eight one nine. Okay. So I would try that, and instead of adjusting your grind, just change the espresso machine because one eight that's an okay flow rate. It's going to pull a little longer, but it is you know it is passing through. So if you wanted to get sixty mils in the cup you are looking at 30 seconds at that point, at that slower flow rate. Um, but at the same time, probably your espresso is gonna be quite concentrated at that point. John, you were saying uh, early on that you look for three to five grams right after the pre-infusion of the drips coming out. Where would that be in the graph? You'd see it right at the end of the pre-infusion? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, can you uh, zoom on, oops, <laughs> how do I go back to that? Mm. There we go. Um, Andres, can you click zoom on your flow chart and post a graphic of it? And then, and if you can't even zoom, tap. I don't know if you know how to change the y-axis. To, 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 instead of going to 12 bar, go to like five. Because what we want to see is the thick brown line in detail. That thick brown line is the current weight of the espresso. I have my, I have a tablet here so you can see. Cool. So tap um, on the middle of the blue line chart. And we That's can see that. Yeah, we can see that really well. That's great. And now. Um, uh, and this spike is because I touched the cup. So it's not an actual change in weight. Okay. I don't know that you have. Oh, no, sorry. You, I'm looking at a photograph on it right now, right? Yes. This okay. Is... Do, do you actually have the app? No, but I can, I can go get it. This is okay. a, a, this so, is a different... wh what I'm looking for is um, I would like to zoom in on the blue brown chart because when you do that, another brown line will appear. So there's two brown lines when you zoom in. One is the change in weight and the other is the total weight. Okay, I, I can go get the, the tablet and yeah. I'll be right back. Um, <clears throat> what, what we're, what we're going to see, so this was a feature I added specifically for Blooming, which is there are two brown lines now if you zoom in on this chart. One brown line has always been the flow rate into the cup, right? 
And the other brown line is the current weight in the cup, just the total weight. And that's mostly not useful, except in this blooming case, because it allows you to go back and see right before the pressure arises, how much is in the cup. And uh, generally I found if there's more than 10 grams of dripping in the cup, then the grind is too coarse. And it's not gonna taste good. And if there's less than three- We'd be looking out at 45 seconds in that chart. Exactly. what the weight would be. Exactly. All right, Andres, come back here. You have to say something so that camera goes to you. Okay, here we go. Great, so tap on the there. Great, fantastic. And now, can you, let's see if we can see. So there's the dripping. It's gonna be hard. Oh yeah, there, yeah. So I do need you to change the y-axis so that we see the dotted brown line in great detail. Do you know how to do that? Nope. Okay, so uh, top left of the chart, right around nine, tap, tap there, okay? Keep tapping, go back to it, yeah. Good, excellent. All right, so that's how you change your y-axis. So now we can see the dotted line. Actually, you could go even further. So we can, we, I wanna really be able to read that dotted line. Yeah, you don't have to go so close to the left edge. Um, and anywhere on the left third of the chart will work to zoom. Great, so keep going, keep going. Awesome, okay, now tell us right before that pressure rise, where is that dotted line? What, what is it reading? Uh, right here is uh, getting to one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I think that you had very, very little dripping. You only had about one gram of dripping. Okay. okay. Uh, as, as opposed to have gone up. Um, sorry. No, not sorry. What I'm looking at, just to, to, to um, see where the blue line is going straight up, it crosses a dotted brown line. Okay. At about 40 seconds. Yeah, move your finger up from there and you will see it crosses a dotted brown line. Right here. Yeah, and the dotted one there. And the dotted one, so that the scale on the dotted brown line is in uh, tenfold. Okay, so if it were one, it would be in 10 gram. Okay. And I, it looks to me like it's 0.3 or so. 0.2. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you were at two or three grams which is on the low side, not terrible. Uh, last week I pulled a shot that had three grams and it tasted fine. Um, so looking at that line, you can go later and say, okay, how much dripping did I have? That's not bad, but it, those are correlating nicely, those facts, which is you had very little dripping and you went over pressure. So yeah, you could take off a half gram or a gram of coffee and that would probably give you a bit more dripping and a little less pressure. So that's one approach. You could go slightly coarser, which would have the same effect, a little bit more dripping, less pressure. Or um, you could say, that's okay. What I've got in terms of dripping is in a happy margin, just lower the flow rate. If I were lowering the flow rate, um, I don't know what, what kind of coffee you prefer. If you're the kind of person who likes a really intense, thick coffee, then I would leave the grind where it is, just lower the flow rate at the end, you're gonna get a very thick slurry, super extracted, and it's gonna be like punching you in the face. But it, it should be really nice, like huge, intense coffee. If you want something more watery, um, then I would go coarser. Okay. Yeah, and for this, this particular one uh, is from George Howell, it's a drip roast. Mm -hmm. And I did get a lot of the Earl Grey tea, but the nectarine and lavender were really, nowhere to be found. Yeah, and that, that is your high pressure. Yeah. So the high pressure will absolutely suppress flavors. They end up just being boring. Okay. So since it's a howl, um, I would say coarser. Okay. This is, this is not like the medium, medium light at all. Uh, no, no. It's got a it's, lot of interesting tea stuff going on. Right, it's, it's light, lighter roast for drip. So great, thank you. If you want to do that and come back, um, I don't have a problem. <laughs> we'll be here. Um, all right, so <clears throat> the questions. What happens to flavor on a regular shot if you use the same temperature profile as blooming? So um, <clears throat> there is a theory in coffee that 
um, higher temperature is better at the beginning of the shot, lower temperature at the end. And the idea there is, is that when coffee is first being extracted, first five, 10 seconds, it gives up its materials quite easily and there are not many unpleasant flavors. Uh, but there isn't a lot of complexity either. And so a higher temperature at the very beginning will get you more flavor extraction at the very beginning. But at the end, when the coffee is giving up less of its flavor easily, if you use a high temperature at the end, um, then you're gonna get more unpleasant flavors. Now, I wanna say that is a theory because I argued to Rayo that the exact opposite could be true as well. The lower temperature at the beginning is desirable because the coffee is giving up its material so easily. And then you want a higher temperature at the end because the coffee is not giving up its material and you need higher temperature in order to um, get the stuff out. You kind of went, huh, I don't know that anyone's tested that versus that. So, uh, and that's because there aren't really any temperature profiling machines around except for ours. Um, but more to the point, when you put hot water into a cool puck, which is always the case, you end up with an infusion temperature, which is somewhere in the average. Twice as much water is absorbed as the weight of coffee. So let's just say you have 20 grams of coffee, you will get about 40 grams of water added to that. Your 60 gram slurry then is an average. So typically when the shot is in the first second or two, it's probably around 80 Celsius, okay? What we do differently than um, other machines is put hotter water in because we're measuring the puck temperature. So when people talk about decent espressos at say 92, the beginning of the shot is probably at 95, 96 automatically. And that's the thin red line doing it for you to try and get your infusion temperature up. Now you can help make that even more. And, and I think there's a really strong argument for the beginning of the shot being say four Celsius hotter. Um, I did an experimental version of the app uh, which automatically gave a two temperature, two centigrade boost at the beginning during pre-infusion. Uh, people didn't like being forced to do that, so I took it off and we didn't really find out what that did. Um, <clears throat> but um, if you want to experiment with hotter temperatures during pre-infusion, let me show you how to do that. It's very easy. All right, so I'm gonna choose the default profile here. And the default profile is currently at 88 Celsius. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the default profile into an advanced profile. Okay. Whenever you create an advanced profile, it automatically copies whatever your current profile is and puts it here. And then here on pre-infusion, I'm going to take the temperature. And I've just made a 96 Celsius pre-infusion and then it drops rise and hold to 88, 88. Okay, so now I've just tested that. And if I hit okay, I will make that shot. Um, might actually be worth doing that. <laughs> so uh, I would love if people did what I just demonstrated because I'm very curious about temperature profiling and its effect on flavor. I feel like there's some really uh, lightly positive flavor effects to be gained from that. And what I'm thinking of doing, if that is the case, if it really does taste better, I'm thinking of changing the user interface so that instead of the temperature being here, the temperature would actually be here, here, and here. And you could easily choose three different temperatures through your shot. Okay, but I'm not gonna do that work and make everyone's life slightly more complicated unless it really makes the coffee taste better. So uh, please, those of you who are interested in experimenting, try two or four Celsius boosts at the start or something else or boost at the end. Uh, see if you like the flavor. If you do, then it's a good argument for that feature to, to arrive. Um, any other questions? Um, I might actually do that shot since I just programmed it. <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna, uh, unless people want to go back to blooming, which I'm happy to, mm, let me do a blooming with flow since this call is about blooming.
So uh, let's see. So it says update available. So what I want to show you is if you mess with one of the default profiles. Uh, I need to see who it is. There we go. All right, I'm back. Um, just need to see whose mic was on. Okay, so if you mess with a profile and it's no longer the default, what we sent from you, what you can do is you can fix that. So I'm gonna hit Blooming. I'm going to trash can it. And then I go to app, app update, okay? And by trash canning uh, an included profile and doing an update, it's going to pull the default version that I made originally back on here, okay? I don't know, I might be able to get away with actually not even restarting the app. Yep, no, it's blooming. Okay. So there's Blooming Espresso. It's come back, even though I deleted it. And you can see it's now flat flow. There's no pressure ramp. Um, while I prepare this, I'm gonna put it on mute. If you guys have questions for each other, talk, because I cannot hear you while I'm grinding. Hey, Peter. Peter, are you there? All right. Yeah, I'm here. I'm struggling with my uh, with my mouse. All right. I was curious about this uh, use of the uh, chopstick in the middle. I've been playing around with it as he's been talking, but my machine's pretty wonky right now and it crashed on me. So. I'm not sure, but if I understand you correctly, you put some grinds in, all your grinds in, then you make a donut, kind of like making a V60, traditional V60, and then you WDT, how, do you, how does that work? Okay, I grind into a catch cup, and I'm using a flat. Okay. So we're pretty similar. Um, I WDT in, in the catch cup. Then I use a, a funnel and I pour into the portafilter. I tap once in the portafilter, and I'm not religious about that, but then I spin the funnel and I take it off. Now I'm looking at a fairly flat, oh, I do Scott Rouse, uh, you know, his circular motion, <laughs> and I, I now I'm looking at a fairly flat distribution of grounds, all the grounds in the portafilter. Then I just take anything thin, pencil shape, and I make a depression in the center. Now I'm trying not to compress anything. I'm just making a depression. And so now I'm looking at a donut. It pushes everything else outwards. And if you're a little high on one side, you can just make that depression a little over that side and it'll push more grounds to the other side. So the depression might be a centimeter across and, and go two thirds of the way through. And then you're done. Just tamp normally, and off you go. I have no idea. So it's not even. Well, you've got a you've got a crater in the middle. A crater. You could call it cratering or making the donut, depending right, on right. whether your there cup is, tasted good. Or in the middle. Okay, and it's not unlike what happens with the uh, convex tamper shape. Correct, Damien. You know, uh, uh, Damien over on. Uh, 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 on diaspora, I think he arrives at the same effect from what I can tell by using the convex tamper shape, but I've never tried one. I don't know. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm on the <clears throat> pausing time of my blooming and pause uh, should end any second now. There's my pressure rise and I haven't changed anything from the previous one, I think this is probably gonna to be too fine. Yeah. And the reason I thought it was gonna to be too fine is because remember the previous one uh, was a nine bar at the end, but it only did about 
one and a half mils per second. So here I am. So, so here's that. I don't have the scale on, which would have been helpful here. Okay, and you can see my pressure went too high and I had the same thing Andres did, which is I wasn't able to hit the flow rate I wanted. And so the pressure went too high. Okay, now I could choose to change the flow rate. I'll just show you how to do that. Here I go to advanced, I hit the flat flow section. And then here where it says 2.2 .2 mils per second, I can change it to 1.8, for example. And that would get me an espresso that wasn't over pressure. And um, I'm gonna do that since I recommended it. While you wait for Andres. That'll be my next one. I um, came up with an espresso. Doesn't smell like much. I get kind of like a marshmallow smell. Um, it's a little bit too hot right now, but um, when I taste it, I expect compared to this, it's gonna be really muted. And, and that's a lot more open, but then again, it's cool too. Um, there was a question we never addressed on the chat, which was what about 15 versus 18 versus 20 grams? Um, I really like 15 grams as, as a dose. I find it easy to work with, but I also find that with light roasts, it's a harder to pull off a blooming with less coffee. And so generally, if I'm doing light rose blooming, I'm at 18. But I don't know of any rules or advice to give you. I would have to turn it over to you guys. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to prepare another 18 gram puck to pull the same blooming, but a slower flow rate at the end. And while I do that, can anyone who's got an opinion opine? And Andres, we're going to talk to you and your shot in just a second. Okay. So if you have any opinions about 15, 18, 20 gram baskets and blooming, please say something. All right, if no one has anything to say, then Andres, why don't you talk about the shot you just pulled? Yeah, so I, I did what you suggested. I went a little coarser and then it definitely helped. I think I may have, so that those are the two shots, right? The original one, uh, God shots, and then the one that I just pulled. Uh, I think I, I adjusted a little too much. It was like 13.5 on a niche and I went to like 14.5. I think 14 would be more of a happy medium. It is a very different shot uh, using the same uh, dose. It is a lot brighter. Uh, you know, the other one was really muted. Now, now that I compared the two side by side, the other one was really, really muted. This one is a lot brighter, a lot of the, the higher uh, and uh, higher part of the, the range. And uh, I just need to bring the acidity down just a little bit for my personal taste uh, on in espresso. Like if you do it, this were a filter, I would probably be okay because of the larger volume, more dilution. But for espresso, I prefer it just a little less acidic than, than what I got now. But it's a better shot. Uh, if I were to err on either side, I would err on this side just because you get more of the coffee. The other one was definitely like just... And, and what would you do to, to vary the acidity? How would you do that? So I think uh, going somewhere in the middle and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, John, somewhere in the middle because then it will bring... Right, the first one, I brought too much of the roast flavors because of the pressure, so it was like darker tasting. I was good, I, I enjoy pretty much all the spectrum. Uh, but I think if I went somewhere in the middle, then I will get more of the mid-range, so to speak, uh, flavor-wise. But correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, you know, I got the decent just like a week, two weeks ago. I'm still playing around with it. Oh, Andres, uh, can you talk about the smell on the shot you just pulled? So you get more of the more floral aspect of it. Like the lavender is what they talk about, but definitely more on the floral side. Uh, of things. 
the other one was more toward the, the you know, I don't know how to explain exactly, but like it was most of the roast flavor. So it was no, like, that's exactly right. That's, 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 that's exactly right. It's muted and roasty. Floral, uh, floral side. And then the flavor is definitely brighter uh, and more uh, fruity than the other one. I, I, than the first one. The first one was again like more on the tea, dark tea, Earl Grey side. This one is more uh, on the fruity side, which again, to me, I would love to find a happy medium where I get a little bit of both. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, that's typically what I find as well. That's why I want to ask you about what it smelled like is when you've got a light roast and you've almost got it dialed in, but it's a bit too bitey, too acidic. Um, if you have really great stuff on the nose, then you know you're close, right? So if you're, and, and, you just, and often you just want to breathe them. <laughs> just like, oh, it smells so good, but uh, a, bit, a bit tough. Um, you're really close, and I would be tempted to not change the grind and just add a gram. Just to have a little bit of pressure, because if it's smelling really good, I'm like, oh, I don't want to mess with the grind. Um, so, uh, and just see if the extra gram gives you a bump up in pressure. You just need two or three bar more pressure at the end, and you will probably be where that needs to be. Um, the other thing is um, how long, I don't know how much water ends up in the cup at the end. It was uh, 58.8 grams. <clears throat> yeah, so that, that's fine, I think. And you were 18 in? Okay, um, fine. I mean, I, I 54, 56 is what I would normally do. So totally fine um, there. So uh, if you feel like trying a gram more coffee, go to 19 grams. And um, if you want to pull it an extra four grams more, that's fine. But really what I'm looking for is to see if we can get you between six and nine bar without any more tinkering. And who needs to sleep tonight, right? What's that? Who needs to sleep tonight? If I that's, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> you can always you know, have it as a nice coffee tomorrow morning. Uh, and by the way, those really acidic coffees taste great uh, affogato. So don't throw them out, just store them and have them with some ice with vanilla ice cream. And the acidity goes away and the floral characteristics are fantastic. Um, Uh, no, I don't know. Ah, yeah, I was going to prepare another puck. <clears throat> yeah, it's fine. Um, I was going to prepare another puck, and hopefully you guys were going to talk about 15 versus 18 versus 20 grams. It didn't happen, but nonetheless, I'm going on mute. So anyone who has a question for anybody else, go ahead. Uh, I'm off for a minute as I prepare the puck. Something I haven't mentioned, so the tap is not purely needed, but I, I do the tap because it collapses the puck and it allows me to see whether I have any defects in my prep. Now, this one I'm, I'm kind of showing off because they don't come out usually as well as this, uh, but that one came out really, really evenly. So I always, I groom, I do a tap, um, and then I observe, um, did I do a good job or not? And, and then I try to pay attention to how the shot comes out later. Uh, and usually it correlates to what that looked like. So 
So again, the only thing I've changed John, on is the flow rate at the end. It, it, if, you, if you tap and you see that there's a depression where you tap, which means the grooming wasn't consistent, I assume, do you then re-groom over that to add some coffee on top or you just let it slide? I, I let it slide because I'm just trying to learn. And I find if I obsess um, and try to get things too perfect, um, Sometimes it's just I'm not I'm not feeling it. I mean I'm also an extremely mediocre musician who's practiced way too much, and I find that when I'm trying to learn a song and it's not coming together, I don't bang on it for an hour. I just move to another song, or stop playing. Um, and I feel the same way about coffee, which is I'm in this for a long time, and it's much easier to just prepare two coffees in the morning and prepare two more in the afternoon, and that's my learning each day. Um, I'm not in a rush. No, thanks. That's just me to avoid frustration. Uh, some people, I mean, Stefan Reeves will pull 20 shots in the morning. Um, if you have the personality for it. Uh, you can, what you can do, by the way, just to answer your question in a different way. I used to, uh, when I was less good at this. Um, yeah, so the flow's a little lower and the pressure is coming down a little faster, but I could probably lower the flow even more on this one. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys this. So what I did is I lowered the flow from two two to one eight, and um, that did have the impact of the, the, the pressure spike being not as bad, but still pretty bad. This is still a pretty muted coffee. So at this point, I don't really go down, go down to one five. It's just too slow. Uh, coarsening would be the thing to do here. Or grammar too well. But I, I, and I don't know if I don't know if now's the time. But boy, is it intriguing to think about using the uh, your your controls on the group head to see that it's starting to spike and then push back. Um, I just reprogrammed a shot uh, to one point eight and the grind was so far off, it didn't have any effect whatsoever. If you were to do that on the group head, how might you, or maybe that's a call for when we all get our group heads and we're up to speed with that, but it's a really intriguing uh, idea of ways to save shots on expensive coffee that you don't want to throw away. So that's what I did last week as it happens, um, is I took over the shot that in that case was too coarse and I did it. Um, let me pull a decent uh, blooming, a blooming shot rather by hand. And um, we'll see. Now um, I've got, this is the 0.3 simulator basket, which will give me some pressure. Now the problem is, I've got a little stuff there. Um, if I use the puck sim and there's any copy there, it'll block the hole. So I'm just, um, I'm just cleaning the machine right now. Okay, good. So water's coming out, it's not blocking. So I'm ready to use the puck simulator now. Um, that's the same process, by the way, if you use the pour over basket, is do flush, get a towel, and just wipe, like so. Hmm, <clears throat> those are they're straight coffee particles. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and do a manual blooming. Okay. Um, I'm gonna... I can also do a manual blooming with coffee, but let's, okay, good. So you can see here, uh, so in order, in order to create, uh, in order to fully manually control a blooming, you need to create a profile that you're then going to override. Now, the, the default behavior in a blooming is for no water flow at all and for it to be uh, flow control, right? It's flow control pre-infusion flow at the end with nothing in the middle. So what I'm going to do is create a flow profile shot that's going to be zero mils per second through the whole thing. And, um, and that means that when I touch the group head controller, I will be controlling flow. And, um, and when I let go of the group head controller, the flow will go back to zero since that's what the, the profile is all about. So let me show you how to do that. And I need to make this profile and just share it with you. I'll do that shortly so that you guys don't have to do this. But um, I do presets plus, and I create a flow profile. 
Okay. I turn stop it pour off. I turn pre-infusion off completely. And then I turn these two on to full. And now what I've just done is a two minute zero, zero milliliters per second pro, uh, profile. Okay. Um, so when I hit start, nothing's going to happen, but I will be in flow profiled mode. If I wanted to do this in pressure, I'd do the same thing, but let's not talk about that now. This is gonna be manual flow profiling, okay? So in theory, what you could do on a Bianca or any other machine where you had um, a, uh, <clears throat> a valve on the, I'm blanking on the word, a needle valve, um, any needle valve machine, except those would be um, analog and you wouldn't really know what flow you're getting. With this, you really know. So I'm gonna hit um, okay. Uh, also note my temperature is 97.5. I won't be able to temperature profile with this because I'm doing it all manual, okay? So uh, now I hit start, I'm gonna put that there. Um, and what's gonna happen is, um, the whole shot, what I'm doing manually, is going to be also shown on the screen. So if I pull a really good blooming manually, I can choose to make my programmed blooming do the same thing. Okay, so there we go. We're nowhere, there's no water, the shot has started, okay? So now I'm gonna go here, and what it happens is four mils per second of water is happening. You can't really see that, but you'll see it in a second. And I'm filling up the puck. Essentially, this is my pre-infusion. And then as soon as pressure starts to rise, I'm washing pressure. Pressure is rising. Okay, I stop. And there, there's my pressure, there's my pre-infusion. This would be dripping during this stage. And you can see the, so there I was. I did a four mils per second pre-infusion until pressure, uh, sorry, four mils per second here. Pressure rose, and then I took my finger off the group head. And so there's no more water flow, okay? And we're just waiting the 30 seconds. So this is a manual blooming. Let's see, so it's about 30 seconds there. So at about 55 seconds, I'm going to ramp the pressure back up. That's a bit annoying. All right, so here we go. And let's just say we want two mils per second. Okay, but that we want more pressure. Let's just say we're too coarse. So now I'm increasing the flow and we're going to see the pressure increase. Okay, and now I'm happy with that. I am lowering the flow in order to have stable pressure. Okay. And then I stop. So uh, there you are with a manual blooming. I'm going to go through that again. So here we are with nothing was happening, pre-infusion. I stop when the pressure arose. I stop by just lifting my finger off of it. I ah, forgot to connect my... Uh... It's always a technical thing, isn't there? <laughs> All right. All right, well, let's screen try. All right, well, my auto refill is not happening. Demo hell. Uh, rather than checking cables right now, I just changed the machine last night. It looks like I didn't plug something in. Bugs is gonna see if she can uh, spot it. Um, anyway, that was a manual blooming. Um, and um, there's another way to use the manual controls, which is to let the shot just be a automatic blooming. And at the end of the shot, at the end of the blooming rather, when the flow comes out, you can adjust the flow manually. And I'd be happy to do that as soon as we get more water in. Can I turn this on? This is on. Okay, and I can just do that. 
Chris. <clears throat> that looks more like uh, the firmware from yesterday having a bug <laughs> is what it looks like. Uh, so all I did there is I, I forced it to refill the tank by putting the machine to sleep. Um, and when it went to sleep, it filled the tank. Uh, so here we are, we're back to this. So pressure rose, I saw I put that much flow in, I saw that wasn't enough to give me the pressure I wanted, so I brought out the flow up again. Once I was with the pressure I wanted, I dropped the flow a little bit, and then I stopped the shot here. Okay, so that's what the manual blooming looked like. Um, is there an interest in um, overriding the flow at the end? Is that something I should show you guys how to do? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I will open another bag. Um, I can get that started. I've coarsened the grind just now because I'm just too fine overall on the blooming. I've just gone, I think, a half notch. Um, and what I'll probably do is I'll look at how much dripping there is to give me an idea of probably what I'm gonna need to do if I need to make the flow faster or slower. Um, I'm also, I'm gonna go back to the stock blooming because I modified the blooming just now to, what did I do? I changed the flow at the end. Now I've gone back to two, two mils per second. So I never saved my change on that one. So I'm gonna dose out 18 grams. Let the blooming continue, and I'm just going to come in and step in at the end and alter the flow to give me the pressure I want. Okay. Hey, John. Yep. Um, sorry. Um, can you tell me on the GHC what button you pressed to change the flow? Okay. So um, whenever you press anything on the group head controller, it's a clock you get that flow or pressure wherever you are, where, your, where your finger is, okay? So if I'm doing, if I'm in a flow stage and I hit the 4 p.m. spot on there, um, it gives me um, four mils per second. And if I press two, it gives me two. Now there's two ways to alter flow with the group head controller. You can either push your finger down and hold it, or you can tap. And those have completely different behaviors. If you put your finger down, then the flow will go to wherever your finger is, but if the effect is temporary. As soon as you lift your finger, it reverts to program, okay? And the reason for that is to handle exactly this case. We've got a profile that's zero mils per second. We say four, we lift, we go back to zero, okay? Um, there is another thing you can do, which is tap, which is what we call tweak mode which is there's a shot that's doing, let's say, four mils per second. And if you tap above it, each tap is a 0.1 increase. And if you tap below it, it's a 0.1 decrease. So um, let me um, show you what that looks like, because this is not really well understood. Okay. So I'm going to do flow right now here. And just, just for the sake of this demo, um, I'm going to do two mils per second for a minute, okay? And what I'm gonna do now, uh, I haven't put coffee in, so I'm gonna keep using the pup simulator. That should be fine. Um, the, I, I paused for a second because I thought, okay, it, the puck sim is gonna give me a certain amount of pressure, which means I probably can't go to six mils per second because a, a puck can't do that, right? just the whole point. But two mils is a, a happy place. Okay, so this shot's gonna start in a second, and if I do this right, yeah. My hope is to do this in such a way that you can see it on the screen. Okay, so now what's happening is we're getting two mils per second. Okay, and if I tap here, each time I tap, if you can see the group head, it's blinking each time, okay? And my flow rate has increased, and it's increased permanently. And if I tap, I always do this. The shot is set to end a certain amount, a certain flow certain total water volume. Let me turn that off. So that's right here. 
Okay. So that's happened if you touch on a group head controller machine, it tells you what to do. Which is back here. Okay. So um, if you've got something happening on your machine, you want to go faster or slower. So each tap, each tap is one increase. Okay. So I'm just, it's within a third, within about that much radius above it. And you can see each tap is increasing it. And I can do the opposite, which is tap below. Okay. And each one that that's now decreasing it. And if I do a bunch of taps quickly, I've now lowered that and that that's sticky. Okay. But that's now the profile. So now if I hold it down, I'm now going to that setting and I can hold it down and move it to a new setting. Okay. And if I let go, it's going to go back to whatever the current profile is set to. Okay. Um, so that's me tapping and you can see how the dotted line is following whatever I'm doing. Um, and then what happened there is I held it down and then when I let go, it reverted back. So, um, those two modes, those two ways of using the group head controller allow you to completely take over by holding the finger down, which then goes to that setting, lift your finger, it reverts the program or tap to alter the program uh, permanently, at least for that step. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, that's very new. Um, if you're in a pressure stage, it, then um, holding your finger down will go to that pressure. Uh, let's, let's do that. I haven't done that before, at least not on camera. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, I'm just going to use the default here, okay, but I'm going to give myself lots of time. So I'm going to go to 8.6 bar after pre-infusion, okay, and I'll turn that off. So I've got a one minute shot. This is actually basically the E61 shot. And let's turn that on. So the, if I were to tap in the very beginning, that's when pre-infusion is happening, I'm in flow mode. So it would be affecting the flow rate of pre-infusion. Uh, I don't want to demo that right now uh, because we're trying to show pressure. So there's our pre-infusion happening. Our pressure is going to rise. And when it does, we're going to enter pressure mode. Sorry. I put the wrong portafilter in. So the normal forward filter in, which is doing all right. All right, let's try again. All right, so there's my pre infusion. You can see and hear pressure rising. And now we're going to exit pre infusion imminently. There we are. The flow is increased to try and get the pressure. Okay. And if I want to lower the pressure, once again, stop at pour at 36 mils. Ruin the demo. Make a coffee. You're always thinking uncaffeinated. Yeah, I need more caffeine, says Bugs. <laughs> Okay, pre infusion, pressure rise, pressure stage. We're at 8.6 bar, and I'll lower the pressure to 6 bar. Okay, see the pressure come down to 6 bar, pressure come down to 4 bar, and if I let go, the pressure will go back to 8.6 bar because that's what it's set to. If I tap here a couple times, and I've changed the pressure permanently of the profile. Okay. So that's me lowering the profile and then let's bring it down to something absurd like two bar and then stop. So I've got, I'm doing different things there. I'm holding. Uh, that's the, that's the pressure profile that 
is on the machine. Um, and then I put my finger down and lowered it down to these settings. And then I let go. And so I went back to default. Then I tapped to go there, tap some more. Okay. So, uh, and all the while flow is doing whatever flow has to do to create the completely insane pressure lines that I'm creating. Uh, hopefully that wasn't overwhelming. It's good. Um, the goal, the goal was we looked at every approach to variable control from spring levers to manual levers to the monument to the uh, rocket R9 to the Bianca and we want to be able to do all of them. Like so, and it turned out that approach, holding, tapping, pressure versus flow mode allows us to do what every machine on the planet does in real time, but better because it actually gives you the number that you asked for. Um, I'm going to pull a blooming with a correction at the end so that it doesn't look insane like what I just did. Um, what's the ideal ratio for blooming espresso, light roast? Uh, typically three to one is, is typical. Um, going as far as 3.5 times in the cup to one, um, two and a half is okay. Uh, I would not do a two to one shot with blooming and I wouldn't, mm, if you want to go to four to one or something like that, I would go to the allongé, the blooming allongé or the allongé. Uh, now I'm in dangerous territory because I'm opening a new bag. So my grind, I'm going to adjust my grind another half because the, that bag was a week old. So means I'm going to be out of calibration. That's how it is. Um, we're nearing on two hours, so this will probably be the last thing I do. And then what I do is I just, uh, I'll leave the room and if there's anything you guys want to talk about, you can. It's only 18 grams. I don't have to make mistakes. I'm still in default. So uh, one thing I've done, which is good, is I switched to default and I switched to blooming and I shouldn't pull the shot right away. I should give the machine just a little bit of time to heat up. If you look um, here, you can see gold temperature and metal temperature and the metal temperature is coming up, but it was at 88 because that's what my shot was. So 92, 97, so by the time I, Get a cup.
Uh, I'm also looking at the mirror here. I should have been before just to see what it looks like when it starts. It's pretty even. It was a donut, so it did start out in, but pretty quickly. Uh, I've got a scale here. I'm using a just a traditional scale. I'm at two grams of drippage right now. So this is probably going to actually be okay. Um, three grams now. It's on the slightly too fine side, so I might end up pulling the flow back a little bit if I go beyond 10 bar. All right, we're four grams of drippage when the pressure starts to ramp up. And I'm going to watch this. Now, in fact, I need more flow. I need more flow because my pressure is too low. And okay, now I'm at. I'm increasing the flow and I'm stopping. Uh, I pulled the shot a little bit longer than I liked. The 66 grams in the cup from 18. But uh, let me show you the, the chart and why I was doing what I was doing. So um, the pre infusion. This, by the way, is going away in 1.4. It's one of the reasons we have the USB, sorry, the uh, larger power supply, is so it doesn't interrupt you. I probably am the only one who really cares. All right, good, we're back. Um, okay, so let's zoom that a bit. So there's our pre-infusion, the pressure, we drop some pressure there, there's our pause, and then the ramp up, to that flow, and that flow was only giving us four bars, which I deemed was too low. And so what I did is I put my finger on the group head controller to raise it to here, which gave us a pressure of about seven and a half. And then as the puck started to erode, I decided to give it still a little bit more flow. I just kept cranking up the flow so as to have the whole blooming, it ended at six bar, right? So six to seven and a half bar, which for me, this is a medium light roast. Um, I, I find it tastes better with a bit of pressure. And I don't really mind the higher flow, but it's too hot to drink still. And I'm just pouring it into a big ceramic cup to cool it off. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so it's slightly acidic, a little bit more than I might like, um, but it has a lot more top notes than this coffee usually has. So, all right, let's look at, we've got a graph from Peter Ram that he pulled some shots. Uh, Bradley says he got a 25% extraction yield uh, and it tasted really great, which is, that's pretty amazing. Um, obviously the taste matters. So let's see, I'm looking at the graphic from Peter Ram. Um, Peter, can you say why you think this, your, your chart looks a bit strange? Um, I'm just not used to seeing such low pressures. Okay. Um, is this a light roast? Uh, it's a medium light. Yeah, um, you, you might want to go slightly finer, but how did it taste? You know, the, the coarser one tasted better than the finer one. Yeah. And it's exactly what you said. I'm tasting notes I haven't tasted in that coffee before. You could also do coarser and just add up the dose. Then you okay. get the advantage of the two. Um, I'm impressed. Good, I'm glad it tasted good. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what we have to go by, of course, is what it tastes like and then changes we make to change to make the flavor. And we should never use the charts to tell us whether it tastes good. Use our palates. And then mimic, then use the charts to try and recreate what tasted good. Um, John, uh, sorry. 
a theoretical question. So we are putting we are putting in the pre-infusion about 20 to 30 grams into the basket, and then we leave more. it sit for 30, yeah, for 30 seconds. Yes. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so in that stage, we will extract the, the sourness, the sweetness, and a bit of bitterness. And then with the rest of the time, we are pushing this volume out of the puck. So we are adding a bit more bitterness to the to the coffee or is I mean how can we control that we get more sweetness um, right. when we have so much control over the yeah okay so uh, a couple things so just to get the numbers right um, at the beginning there your pre-infusion is at four mils per second and we're typically doing more than 10 seconds right about 12 13 seconds so that was about 50 mils of water uh, it's not important to what you're saying in, in terms of the, the flavors and control. Um, I'm just, I think, someone's piping. <laughs> okay, whoever's typing, just on and just do it. Oh, Thomas, I think. Um, okay, so um, it's about two to one. In this case, a little bit more water. The finer you go, the more water coffee can absorb. And since blooming is very fine, we're putting about 50 mils of water in this one for 18 grams of coffee. Um, so, but to go to your, your flavor questions, I would say it's just not so simple um, in terms of getting bitterness and, and sweetness. So uh, first of all, I don't like the word sweetness at all. I, I don't use it because coffee has virtually no residual sugar. So when we're talking about sweetness, what we're really talking about is an absence of things that make it unsweet, things that make it sour. Okay, so uh, bright is often a word that's used for sour. And, and if you wanna use the word bright, that's fine. Um, but um, the other thing is, is just like wine, if you make a coffee that has no sourness, it's boring. And you can test this if you like by taking an espresso and switching and doing three glasses at every 10 seconds. And you'll see that each of those 10 second parts of coffee is not great. That only by mixing them do they taste better. And we tried this um, at World of Coffee in Berlin last year. We took all the drips and we switched the, we switched the blooming espresso right as the pressure ramped and we did not include the drips. And the drips uh, contributed a lot to the drink. They, they were sour, but they have a lot of complexity. Um, and without it, we didn't like the way blooming tasted. So generally, I'm going to say um, sourness is uh, that acidity is I is is water going too quickly through beans. Just that that's generally what I would say. And most of the time, it's because your extraction is not even. So if you're channeling, then you have water going through at a lower pressure too quickly through the beans, and that's giving you under extracted coffee in the mix and it tastes sour or lack of sweetness. So when people talk about a sweet shot, what they're really usually talking about is a shot that I extracted without channeling through the whole shot. That's what makes it sweet, okay? Um, now, as the shot gets longer and longer, for me, it takes on flavor characteristics that are more reminiscent of uh, filter coffee. And depending on where you are and the flavors you like, you may want to pull longer or shorter. So if you're using a filter roast, generally it's because you like filter coffee and you, you want more of that drip coffee flavor. Uh, and so you pull a longer ratio. But um, the other thing I'll say is the longer it runs, the more coffee flavor you extract. And if there are any bad flavors, you're gonna extract them too. So last week, these beans uh, were tasting dusty and I was doing about a 1.8 to one ratio to keep the dustiness from coming out. If I did a two, 2.2 ratio, which is what I would normally do, I got that unpleasant flavor. And unpleasant flavors are common in coffee. We're often working around beans that are imperfect. Um, okay, so to go back to your uh, question of how do you dial in the beans so that you get more sweetness? So the number one thing to look at is uh, channeling and even extraction, okay? Um, and 
that is largely going to be caused by either you don't have a good grinder or you have a bad, uh, sorry, uneven puck prep. I won't judge it. So in terms of grinders, there's the niche is the most common uh, among our customer base. There are other good grinders out there, but if you had, for example, a Baratza grinder, I would say that's probably the cause of your sourness. More generally, I would say if your grinder costs less than 500 euros, 500 pounds, 500 dollars, it probably is bad. That's part of the cause of your bad flavor. Um, if you're running, if you have an EK and it's sour, it's probably your burrs are misaligned and you're, you're causing channeling. Either way, usually you can see the cause of sourness by looking at the bottom of your portafilter. And you should see either a variety of colors, which is an uneven extraction or water coming out the side, um, or it just, it's just gushing. The key thing with our machine to prevent sourness is that you can see flow rate and pressure. And with other machines, you are frequently um, extracting two, three, four bar coffee, but you don't know it because the pressure gauge tells you nine. Uh, so that's the principal weapon against sourness is to um, achieve flow rates. If you're doing pressure profiling, achieving flow rates no more than three mils per second if you're at nine bar, right? Allongé is a separate case. I don't want to talk about that right now. But um, generally, if you're making traditional espresso in the 30 to 40 second range, you want a flow rate that is somewhere between one and two and a half mils per second and a nice stable pressure. Um, I will say that as the lighter the roast, the more quickly the puck will degrade. And to compensate for that, you can either updose or pull the shot shorter or you can lower the pressure. And lowering the pressure is the strategy I take the most. Um, and that is, the pre that is the strategy also that all the lever machines, all the, if they have a spring lever, that's what they do. They naturally decrease the pressure over the course of the shot. That is the most straightforward way to cope with the natural puck degradation of a shot. I just gave you a lot of information. Can you? I, was that helpful or too much? Do you want a, a follow-up question? Um, no, it was it was a lot of information, but but I I I, I could uh, could get it. Um, so just when we do the step from the blooming to the uh, to the constant flow rate, the water that we put into the puck um, pushes out what is already in the puck. So that means we don't get every water that we see flowing in in the diagram is not really going to the cup. It's, it's pushing out the water that has been in the park for the 30 seconds and has seen like this, this, uh, this, this um, period of time, uh, contact time with the coffee that we will have in the, in, the, in the cup. And then a part which has been like in contact with the park for a very short time. So it's, is that correct or? Yeah, that, that is correct. I think what's happening with the blooming espresso is you're, you're doing um, a half espresso pull, half uh, pour over. So the, you essentially had a one minute pour over, well, 50 seconds, and that you put 50 mils of water into an 18 gram puck, you sat for a minute, and then if you then rise the pressure up to nine bar, all that water that was sitting on the puck is going to mix with clean water and is going to push out. Um, and I think what makes blooming not taste so good is if at the end you have no pressure, well, then you just did a fast pour over. You did a pour over in 70 seconds. If at the end you're getting six to nine bar, then the end is got, it's got espresso flavors, right? It's got oils coming out. Without pressure, you don't get oils. And without oils, you don't have what espresso tastes like. Um, so, uh, I do want to just, I hesitate to make this um, language leap of pushing the water out. I know Slayer talks about it that way. And what I mean is, is there's this feeling like I have this here, let's say this is my coffee puck and I fill it with water during a blooming. And at the end, it's like I'm squeezing all the water out. Well, that's not actually what happens. What actually happens is this, this filled with water and then I add more water right and and if this puck disintegrates then what's going to happen is all that clean new water is just going to go right through here 
and all that water that's been sitting in the coffee pot for 60 seconds is just going to sit there. It's, it's not going to, there's, there's no pushing, right? It's not a plunger. There's no, there's no physical pressure. This isn't that. So uh, a blooming with channeling at the end is just a terrible coffee. All that water in the puck remains and you just have extremely fast extracted channels coffee. So it's, it's important at the end of your coffee to, at the end of your blooming, to have an even extraction, to not have it channeled, to not have a pressure crash, in order to actually get all that bloomed long contact time water into your cup. Mm. But that you would see with uh, a pressure drop. Uh, you you'll, see, you'll see that with a pressure problem, exactly. You'll have your flow okay. and you'll see uh, the pressure climb. And, and if you can hit seven to nine bar and then decrease down to no more than four on a blooming, then that is optimal. And that, that is what tastes the best. Um, but however, it, what also works really well with the light roast is you're just looking for, for espresso pressures, which is typically four bar up. So if you can get in the four to six bar range and end no less than four, then it, the whole time you would compress the puck. The reason I talk about this, uh, these, these magic numbers, is that at four bar, the puck actually compresses enough that you get oils coming out. Under four bar, somewhere around three to four, um, the oils don't come out, right? The oils are not pushed out. There's not enough pressure. And you just have not espresso. You have fast filter coffee. Thank you.